Hello, hi. So welcome to this session um, for the Asian Public Relations Network. Uh, my name is Dr. Ben Harbisher, and over the next half an hour or so, I'll be taking you through um, a book chapter, which is a work in progress at the moment, um, which I'll tell you about in due course, entitled Nudge, Behavioral Science, Normative Discourse, and the Art of Consent. So really, what is this all about? Um, the idea is largely that I've been exploring um, uh, Richard Thaler and Cass Sunstein's um, uh, nudge theory, um, both as a political tool and also as uh, something which has increasingly been used in marketing circles um, to sell a range of goods and services, and, and of course political ideas under the current uh, under the current circumstances. So really, what I've done is I wanted to explore the use of nudge theory, um, or as it's also called, behavioural science. Um, with regards to its deployment during coronavirus in the UK. So really that's uh, what all of this is about. In terms of an introduction to this piece, why this topic? Well, during the very early stages of the pandemic in the UK, um, the British government decided that it wanted to reduce the uh, amount of um, conspiratorial online discourse, so uh, conspiratorial web posts, social media posts, the kind of posts that, that really um, start to undermine the things that the uh, UK establishment was trying to um, encourage, such as safe working practices, um, the safe social conduct, wearing face masks, using a hand sanitizer, and so forth, um, to which they believed that a lot of conspiracy theories online were really being detrimental to the idea of promoting everyone's uh, well-being and safety. So, in a sense, I got very interested in the idea of um, uh, discourse, normative discourse especially, um, how various ideas are established, come into popularity, um, are disseminated in society, and then become new norms. Really, that's what I want to talk about today. So, why this topic? Really, what I wanted to do is spend a bit of time reflecting on the past 12 months of British political history and, and really looking at advertising techniques and technologies as well, and looking at how ideas such as the new normal are mobilised in modern society. So realistically, that's uh, what I've been working on. Um, this particular piece is, um, is a work in practice for a publication um, which is being launched uh, sometime this year by the University of Helsinki. Um, their sociology department has put together a, um, a current edited volume on social control policies for which this piece is hopefully going to be a part of. Um, similarly, myself and a number of colleagues over in uh, Leicester are working on a number of other books at the moment. Um, firstly, we are working on a text on power and COVID, power and media and COVID rather, um, during the pandemic, and a second edited volume looking at uh, the decline of public protest during the last 12 months. So that kind of gives you an idea of the flavour of um, the, the sort of things that I've been interested in researching over the past few months or so. So in terms of the theoretical premise for this work, as I've already mentioned, um, largely what I wanted to do is explore the ideas of Richard Thaler and Cass Sunstein. Uh, hopefully in due course we'll uh, look at those um, in a few moments in a, in a further slide. Um, I, I also tend to work with a French modernist thinker and philosopher called Michel Foucault. Some of you may be familiar with his work. Um, but largely, I work within kind of the methodolo methodological um, parameters that he developed during the um, during his lifetime. Um, archaeology, for example, is uh, is an idea which concerns digging around in the um, public discursive archive of the past to um, to try and understand how a number of institutions and facilities, say the prison establishment, modern healthcare systems, etc., evolved over a period of around three, four hundred years or so. Um, the contemporary version of this, according to Foucault, is what we call genealogy. And um, for figures such as um, Kendall and Wickham, for instance, um, the idea of genealogy is a way of putting archaeology to work in the present. And the premise is that discourse, and for Michel Foucault, and a lot of Foucauldian contemporaries, um, discourse really constitutes a set of practices and ideas um, so it's not just literary theory, it can constitute a range of practices as well, um, which um, which really are ongoing. So the idea is that discourse never ends. Discourse is something that continually evolves and needs to be studied. Um, so other ideas that I've borrowed from Michel Foucault, um, 
uh, within the um, within the range of disciplinary ideas that he uh, created during his lifetime. We'll be talking about how that works in a few minutes. Um, I want to look at the idea of normalising uh, behaviour and normativity um, as part and parcel of this whole um, new, seemingly coercive science that seems to have emerged in recent times via behavioural science and nudge theory. So really what we're talking about is kind of a modern archaeology of um, of recent events, recent historical events uh, over the past 12 months or so. We're going to be looking at nudge theory and behavioural science and the interplay between advertising and marketing and how we now perceive the world around us. In addition to this, um, uh, as an aside, I guess, uh, Philip Saracen's more recent work on Michel Foucault has looked at Foucault's uh, fascination with pandemics um, and in terms of the way in which Foucault perceives Western societies having developed over the last um, couple of thousand years or so, um, we really can break this down into uh, three different precise ages. So the age of kings and queens, um, known to Foucault and a number of other critical thinkers as the sovereign regime, sovereignty era. Um, in which generally in the UK, this kind of lasted from uh, the early medieval to late medieval period, um, after which we start to see the rise of um, industrialization, factories, the industrial revolution, um, the early Victorian period, um, which Foucault calls the disciplinary era, the disciplinary regime, was one in which rather than um, having lords and masters and serfs and servants and slaves, um, uh, society is managed in a very similar way to the way it was um, organized within the factories, for example. Um, so Foucault, of course, is interested in how um, a variety of different regulatory regimes, um, such as organization, um, time stamps, um, uh, organization within factories, organization and discipline within schools, um, cataloging, identifying all of these kind of different disciplinary mechanisms and supervision, of course, um, function during that particular era and what it can tell us about life in that sort of society. Through to the governmental uh, regime, which Foucault considers is more akin to our um, current world circumstances. And this is really what Foucault and Mitchell Dean and some of the governmentalists call um, the governmental society. Um, and if we think about what the raison d'etat, the object of these different types of states that have existed historically throughout uh, Western Europe and mainland Europe, um, the object of the sovereign state was the accumulation of land and wealth. The object of the disciplinary regime was to learn how to manage the population. And the object of the governmental regime is one of uh, security. So it's quite interesting that Philip Saracen uses Michel Foucault's ideas but also considers um, Foucault's own preoccupation um, with uh, pandemics historically that have um, transpired. So in terms of trying to develop a working theory out of all this, really what I'm looking at is different techniques that have historically existed um, for managing different types of pandemics. Um, first and foremost, most recently, of course, we've got the uh, coronavirus. A little bit further back in terms of history, we've got the smallpox epidemic at the turn of the last century. So the close of the 1900s and um, uh, turn of the 20th century. Um, during the industrial, early industrial revolution, we have the Great Plague and the Great Fire of London. Um, and then much further back, we have different types of uh, reactions and responses to leprosy, for instance. So if we look at historically the different types of management for these kind of pandemics that have taken place, uh, one could claim that the sovereign regime uh, would have effectively uh, ostracized any people who um, uh, were um, uh, suspected of having leprosy or for whom it was visibly uh, affecting them and they would have simply been thrown out of the city and um, removed from the city walls. If we talk about the disciplinary regime, the Great Plague, we can talk about this in terms of isolating um, isolating people who are infected, cataloguing them. We can talk about the responses in terms of trying to conquer the plague, trying to defeat it and find a cure for it. But if we think about modern responses to pandemics, actually they've become um, inordinately more sophisticated. And what we can think of here is in terms of the, po the potential that actually, for one, we're continually being told at the moment we might have to live with coronavirus for quite a long time. 
but the modern establishment also tries to make sense of and work with these kind of um, intruders, as Foucault and Saracen would put it. So historically, you have exclusion as a, as a form of social control in terms of leprosy. You have under um, the disciplinary regime different responses to the plague, such as uh, cataloguing, um, certain attempts at isolating this, medical examinations, and so forth, um, to work, working towards cure, hopefully. And then in more of a contemporary context, you have an acknowledgement that we may or may not be living with these uh, intruders, these, um, these biological intruders, for a certain amount of time. In which case, governments try to understand them, try to put them to work to, uh, to a certain degree. We have biological agents. There are entire industries and infrastructures around biotechnology and medical care to speak of as well. So it's quite interesting to look at a number of historical perspectives on this. And what I wanted to do is really think about how society theoretically has been managed over the last 12 months in the UK especially, and on a sliding scale of crisis in terms of quite how bad things have got, quite how far have we regressed at various points from, say, a governmental response to the pandemic to something which is more akin to supervision, policing and discipline, all the way through potentially to sovereign uh, responses. So let's have a look at what this actually means. So let's talk in the first instance about government. And what we notice in the UK is that during the relatively uh, early stages of the pandemic in the UK, uh, it was akin more to the way in which modern governmental societies would actually manage um, a risk on this kind of uh, level. So here, for example, we could claim that Saracen and Foucault worked with the smallpox epidemic of the 20th century. The aim of this was to study the intruder, not to eradicate it necessarily. And of course, as I've already mentioned, the virus is theoretically put to work in a range of different um, in a range of different industries, and overall the aim is, in a sense, to coexist um, with the intruder rather than conquer it outright. And this is really where, in terms of raising public awareness and managing um, the conduct of the public, because really, if we're talking about governmentality, um, we're talking about managing the, the conduct of conduct. The concept relates to an art of government, so to speak. So if we're talking about nudge theory, this is something that was developed by uh, Richard Thaler and uh, Cass Sunstein um, back in the uh, mid-1990s. Um, and the general theoretical premise for nudge theory, uh, it's, it's a form of behavioral science, ultimately. The general premise is, and you can see from the image on the right-hand side, that it's about choice architecture. It's about creating prompts that encourage people to make decisions about their lives that are hopefully intended to um, be for the betterment of their lives. A great example of this, and uh, you'd be forgiven for, uh, for thinking that I'm sponsored by Cadbury's, so that's certainly not the case, but I do like their chocolate. Um, you could be forgiven for uh, thinking that based on the uh, image on the right-hand side of the screen here. The general gist of this is that if we're talking about choice architecture, um, a, a fairly a, a reasonable allegory of this, if we're talking about supermarket psychology, would be, um, if you place the chocolates next to the checkouts, next to the tills and cashiers, people are likely to grab a chocolate bar on the way out of the supermarket and pay for it. Um, but if you put the chocolate at a higher level on the shelf and put fruit or vegetables in front of your consumers, they're, they're likely just to pick up a piece of fruit instead, rather than go the extra couple of feet to take a chocolate bar off the shelf. So the idea of nudge theory is really that by giving your customers or wider society in one respect, a gentle nudge in the right direction, um, and this is what we call liberal nudges, incidentally, um, they can make more informed decisions about their lives. So the overall schema for this is what we call a choice architecture. Um, if we're talking about paternalistic nudges, on the other hand, this is where you start to introduce rules, regulations, and, um, uh, and, and, and various kind of commandments that people have to follow. So that's really the theoretical premise for this. And what I'm interested in is how nudge theory um, initially started to, to work as um, uh, part, of a, part of a series of advertising campaigns to encourage the, mass, uh, the general population in the UK to follow a particular code of conduct. There have, of course, been <clears throat> excuse me, a number of known uses of nudge theory in the UK historically. Um, in the UK, we have an organization um, which um, is a self-coined social um, enterprise organization, I believe, called the uh, Behavioral Insights Team, informally called the Nudge Unit, actually, which uh, was originally set up 
uh, towards the close of David, David Cameron's <coughs> time in government. Uh, the Behavioural Insights team um, now actually works uh, much wider um, for a range of different governments throughout the world. Um, but just in terms of the popularity of nudge theory as a concept in its own right, Cass Sunstein went on to be um, one of the senior um, advisors in Barack Obama's American administration. And of course, we can see that the BIT, the nudge unit in the UK, is now kind of um, sequestered to a number of different um, political organisations throughout the world. So in terms of known uses in the UK, the kind of things that nudges have been used for over the past five to ten years or so include um, working on the um, Brexit campaign, the campaign to um, to separate the UK from the European Union. Um, the nudge unit has been, I believe, instrumental in working on a variety of political campaigns for the British government. It's also worked hand in hand with the public sector for the purposes of um, uh, generating increasing revenue from vehicle taxation and um, for raising profile of people who may need to pay alimony for children, for childcare, etc. So really what we're talking about is an organisation that which works with communications and also for which there are certain financial incentives um, or even administrative incentives for the establishment. So really that's what we're talking about. So if we want to put behavioural science into practice in terms of the pandemic, uh, we can talk about this in terms of the way in which the behavioural insights team, the nudge unit, was instrumental during the early stages of um, infections in the UK, so around about January through to March time before we went into our first full national lockdown. And one of the things that was kind of, um, uh, that was really predominant at the time was how do you get people to change their behaviour? We might well talk about the World Health Organization in a few minutes and we can talk about the um, a variety of different observations from that particular organization um, during the former um, uh, bird flu HM1 virus. However, I digress. So if we're talking about BIT, the nudge unit, uh, one of the things they wanted to do was create a certain degree of disgust, public disgust in a variety of behaviors which previously were commonplace, things that we just did out of habit. As you can see on the right hand side, one of the um, one of the thought showers that were created by the BIT was how do you get people to stop touching their faces? Because we touch our faces habitually several times a second, 15 times a minute, um, or possibly more. Um, why can't we stop touching our faces? If you walk around a supermarket, you'll see people stopping and pondering. And often they put their hands to their mouth, they put their hands to the chin, they might scratch their faces. The point is there are a lot of communicable surfaces uh, from which we could potentially pick up infections, the virus, etc. And really what we need to do is think about a number of alternatives. So think about creating barriers, such as keeping your hands in your pockets. Think about shaking people's hands. What are you going to do as an alternative for that? Well, one of the uh, one of the ideas that was promoted was for people to touch elbows instead of shaking hands um, and so forth. So it was quite interesting that during the early stages of the pandemic, what we could consider a governmental response to this crisis in the UK was a very soft, a very soft response. It was one in which we started to look at changing people's behaviours. So uh, one of these um, campaigns was uh, our Prime Minister, Boris Johnson, um, uh, sang or promoted the idea of singing happy birthday two verses of happy birthday when you wash your hands which roughly equates to about 20 seconds of thorough hand washing um, through to nudging people's elbows instead of shaking their hands but of course the kind of things that the nudge unit has also promoted in more recent times has been to combat um, the disposal of PPE um, litter in, uh, in the UK streets and also to encourage people to volunteer and sign up to help one another. So um, behavioural science in context has been used in this particular way. However, there is um, a stream of this through to PR discourse and mediation in terms of the way that these messages have been mobilised, not just in pri uh, public sector communications, but in a variety of contexts. So we've talked about the nudge unit a little bit. In, um, in wider circumstances, there are a number of uh, advertising and marketing companies who have mobilized a range of campaigns, primarily during the early start um, of the, um, uh, of the uh, infections in the UK, around about the same sort of time, um, March last year, 
when things started to um, uh, to uh, move up again. So we can think of this in terms of OO campaigns. So uh, we started to see the rise to prominence of out-of-home advertising campaigns. The one on the right-hand side of the screen here is a very good uh, example of this. Um, and when we could think about this perhaps in terms of normative discourse, normalizing discourses, the kind of communications which make people think twice about what they're doing. Here we see a sign that says, oh, no, not you again, as if to say, what are you doing out in public? Who are you? What do you think you're doing? There were other signs released, such as uh, we, should re we really should stop meeting like this. And of course, these are really quite lighthearted and jovial, but the message was fairly poignant. It's still related to a normalizing practice of what are you doing in public? You shouldn't be out. There are infections. There is a worldwide crisis going on. Many of these campaigns were promoted um, by um, advertising agencies uh, such as uh, Topham Guerin, um, named uh, after Ben Guerin and uh, his consultancy, um, who looked after in the UK most of the government's social and digital marketing campaigns. And Guerin, of course, is also known for shock advertising campaigns. So not just the relatively low-key kind of social media campaigns that we can see on the following slide here um, for staying home, uh, for, for staying safe, there's no place like home, share some popcorn, watch the TV. This is what we want you to do during lockdown. It's called a living room for a reason, it's because that's where you can live. Um, if you go outside of your houses, you might not live for very long. Um, our NHS needs you playing on the uh, Britons campaign um, to uh, recruit soldiers during the First World War, a little bit there. But also perhaps this one in the top right hand side, uh, backfired because during the uh, very early stages of the pandemic, there was a monumental shortage in the UK of flour and toilet roll and a variety of other resources that people had decided to stockpile. So um, in a governmental sense, these are the kind of ways in which we start to um, change the conduct of people's behaviour, um, start to change people's behavioural patterns in a very kind of soft sort of way. As the pandemic worsened and the UK went into full lockdown from um, from uh, mid-March last year or late March last year, 23rd of March, I believe it was, um, we start to see a shift in the narrative and a shift in the kind of posters. This is one that's been a, um, a running theme throughout the management of the pandemic in the UK. Wash your hands, cover your face maintain a safe social distance from one another. But as the pandemic worsened in the UK, the advertising campaign also became a little bit more um, aggressive if we flip back a couple of slides, because Top and Guerin Consultancy were really quite um, uh, more well known for their um, shock advertising techniques. And really the idea here is to uh, get people to look at these um, advertising campaigns. They deliver very short, very blunt messages, do this, don't do this, don't go outside, don't do X, Y, and Z. So here we have something which is a very striking image. It's in um, uh, colors which are resonant to the majority of people of danger. So we've got a lot of yellow, we've got a lot of red, which of course is reiterated and balanced with the um, lower third of the screen, which um, it should stay home, protect lives, save, uh, protect the NHS, save lives. The UK government's um, ongoing strap line throughout the entire pandemic. Um, until very recently. Um, but of course, you can see the colour scheme is also balanced with the uh, logo at the bottom. But the message is very clear and simple and very direct. If you go out, you can spread it. People are going to die. Don't leave your home. If we move through to um, a, a slight acceleration of this campaign, look him in the eyes and tell him you will always keep a social distance or you'll never bend the rules or tell him the risk isn't real, etc. So we can start to see that there is a much more human emphasis on the risks involved. Um, Anthony, COVID patient, Lorna, COVID patient, uh, patient, quite cleverly giving these patient names as well, so the audience can relate to them. Um, and in more recent times, during probably the second national lockdown in the UK, we've recently just left the third lockdown, um, don't let a coffee cost lives. You might be allowed to go out and buy a coffee from Starbucks or a Costa or some, somewhere like that. But if you're getting a takeaway coffee, remember to wash your hands, cover your face and always keep your distance because the crisis isn't over yet. So if we think of the initial management of this crisis, the initial phase of this management, 
I know the government had uh, a particular policy for contain, delay, research, and so forth. Um, this is part of that strategy in which we can, we, which we can see a very clear um, articulated campaign to get people to socially distance and behave. Now, let's think briefly about discipline, because as a crisis worsened in the UK and the infection rate rose exponentially and the rate of fatalities also rate, uh, raised as well, we can think of the way in which um, this uh, crisis, this pandemic has been managed. Um, as I mentioned earlier, in terms of a sliding scale um, of responses to the severity of the situation, and this is really what I'm trying to, to capture is how these different historical regimes um, would have really responded to the pandemic. Now, interestingly, if we jump back to Michel Foucault's work and uh, the claim of uh, Philip Saracen, and of course, other contemporaries, Mitchell Dean, for example, one of the uh, famous governmentalists, would have con conceived of this the same way, that modern society um, isn't simply uh, one in which kings and queens were replaced by parliament and by politicians in the UK, in, in which they were replaced thereafter um, by another different um, uh, organizational system. Um, but actually what we have is a number of different types of uh, organizational regimes all working together. This is what we call the triangle of sovereignty, discipline, and government. So what I've tried to do is pick away at the idea of as, as the, um, as the um, pandemic has worsened, how can we relate the different techniques and technologies that have been used to manage the population to different historical pandemics. And therein is really what I'm trying to get at. So if we think back to the Great Plague of um, the 16th century in the UK, um, we can liken this to Philip Saracen and Foucault's observations of the disciplinary society, which ultimately aimed to eradicate the plague. Um, and what it did was it looked at analysing the population, isolating the infected and intentionally just curing the disease. Um, but jokingly, perhaps, I've put over on the right-hand side of the frame here an old plague doctor mask from uh, that particular period in time. But this, of course, is an era in which we didn't really have hospitals, we didn't really have a sophisticated social web welfare systems, um, healthcare systems, uh, really education or any of those kind of things. This was really the, um, the, uh, the start of the majority of these types of institutions. If we think then about the idea of normativity, normativity and discipline, how does one get a population to, to behave in a certain way? Well, on the one hand, we can think of this in terms of managing the conduct of conduct. I can start to think about different techniques such as advertising, persuasion, appealing to people's better nature, uh, appealing to people's social conscience, for example. But actually, if we start to think about how we actually manage people's behavior. This is really where we start to see a lot of these campaigns, uh, in a sense, devolve perhaps towards uh, disciplinary regimes. So let's think about what a disciplinary regime might entail here. And what we're talking about is norms and binaries. And we're talking about norms in terms of uh, what makes you normal, what makes you abnormal. But as Foucault would say, it's not actually the normal or the abnormal which is important, it's the norm which has been posited. So. Let's talk about what constitutes norms. If we're thinking about the norm in our current situation, the norm is the new normal. And what do we do? What are we supposed to be doing in the new normal? Well, according to the World Health Organization, um, if you can, if you can um, uh, grasp society at the right time during the rise of any pandemic, you have what we, can, what we call the teachable moment. And the teachable moment before everything either devolves into chaos or uh, until we find a solution for um, whatever the pandemic or situation happens to be. The idea is that if you get people at the right time, you can embed a number of uh, safety, health and safety practices. So the new normal relates to um, the teachable moment, which relates to entrainment, which is, of course is also part of Michel Foucault's notion of discipline. But what we're talking about is we're talking about embedding different types of behavior and normalizing them. So if we think about norms, norms are things like um, if you're going outside, um, a norm in society now might be to wear a face mask. Of course, if you don't wear a face mask, you're going to be abnormal. If you wear a face mask, you might be considered um, somebody who's just obeying the rules, for instance. But again, if we just relate this back to norms, it's norms that are important. So we've got binaries either side of these operating. We can also think of this in terms of the dissemination of different politicized ideas, 
and ideas around the idea of behaviour. If we think of this in terms of the dissemination of these via the mass media, um, the image on the right-hand side of the frame here is actually quite typical of the kind of um, um, publicity and press campaigns that we've seen over the past 12 months. Um, with the rise of terminology such as uh, portmanteaus of co coronavirus and idiots, so COVID, COVID idiots. COVID idiots are people in the UK who, um, as with elsewhere, don't really believe that there's a worldwide pandemic, don't believe there's any threat to themselves or to other people, um, who have done things like hoarded necessary um, goods or services, so have gone and bought all of the toilet paper in the supermarket, leaving none for other people through to people on YouTube who, um, and other social media platforms who have continually uh, disparaged anything that the uh, international uh, community has tried to do to protect um, subjects, uh, citizens against the virus. Um, and also through to bizarre behavior like licking supermarket shelves and posting videos of oneself doing that on, um, doing that on the internet. So um, in terms of the dissemination of this, actually the mass media has been instrumental in um, in promoting a lot of these normalizing ideas around what we're supposed to be doing, how we're supposed to behave, and what we are if we don't follow these particular behavioral patterns. Interestingly, in the UK, um, a number of uh, issues have come to light over the past 12 to 24 months. Um, the UK government has been working um, step by step on an online harms bill to look at the way in which social media functions and the way in which people are... Not just, um, I think freedom of speech is the wrong route to go down with this, um, but potentially posting content which is harmful or detrimental to others. Um, the coronavirus, I think, is is one particular event which has, on, in some respects, shown the, the best of humanity and in other respects shown the worst. Um, possibly to, um, to one extreme, you have people wandering around saying that the coronavirus is being spread by 5G telecom masks, that it doesn't exist. Um, you have certain citizens wandering around saying that it's all a big conspiracy or it's a hoax. So on the one hand, you have the, um, uh, uh, an intentional reduction by the UK government in the kind of conspiracy theories that have um, proliferated around coronavirus and um, the start of legislative orders, bills and laws to try and diminish those kind of discourses. Comparatively, in terms of mass media management, um, we've seen um, uh, a variety of different um, government programmes start to try and um, increase, um, start to try and decrease this kind of conspiratorial narrative within the mass media, but also get mass media and broadcast institutions to, um, to uh, portray stories that are a lot more socially beneficial. So we can think of this in terms of normativity and discipline, discipline being the regimentation and order of society and getting people to believe a particular thing. Um, but the, de the spread and dissemination of these narratives by uh, institutions such as the mass media. So let's think about what actually normal is at this particular moment in time. If you're normal, you're considered to be somebody who practices social distancing, as you can see on the right hand side of the screen here. You're somebody who wears a mask, you wash your hands, you buy responsibly, you don't, um, you don't panic buy goods, you don't stockpile things. If you feel unwell, you practice self-isolation. Um, if you are elderly or vulnerable, you may be practicing shielding, for example. And during the height of the pandemic, in the UK at least, we're allowed to go and exercise only once a day um, within the local vicinity of our homes. So under the quote-unquote new normal promoted by institutions such as the World Health Organization, in the UK at least, this is what constituted normality. If we think about disciplinary regimes in particular, the types of disciplinary regimes that we've seen in the UK over the past few months, and I'm sure this is going to be the same elsewhere as well, include those found in places like supermarkets. One of the reasons that I put this slide in the right hand side of the frame here together for you um, uh, was primarily because in the UK, right at the height of the pandemic and the first national lockdown in the UK, there were monumental queues around supermarkets as people were desperately trying to buy food or essential items, toilet paper, household goods, for instance. Um, there were long queues waiting for people, uh, with people waiting to get into supermarkets. Once you managed to get into the supermarket, you had to follow a one-way system. Many of the aisles in the supermarket were one-way only, um, and you were only allowed to walk around the supermarket in one direction. There were um, 
marshals shepherding people around and at the checkouts they didn't want people waiting in queues so they had them queuing in other parts of the supermarket and then asking them to move forwards when it was their turn to go and buy their items so again quite interestingly this is what we can consider a disciplinary regime one which orders one which organizes categorizes and forces people to comply and behave in a certain type of manner we can also think of disciplinary regimes in terms of uh, supervision and policing laws and coercion of course the coronavirus act of 2020 um, set the context for this but in terms of supervision um, the uh, British public has been um, uh, reprimanded and supervised and occasionally uh, punished for breaking the rules and regulations. Um, on the right hand side of the screen here we can see a variety of images of the police um, in places like Yorkshire where um, during the last national lockdown um, police were uh, driving around the borders of the uh, of places like the city of York trying to reduce the amount of People from different tiers. In the UK, we had a tier system. So if you're in tier um, one, you are relatively safe. Depending on the amount of infections in your uh, local area, you might be in tier two or tier three, um, in which case you weren't allowed to travel into a different tier where things like restaurants and public houses were open. So um, the images on the right here, obviously, you can see somebody out for exercise. Um, for their legitimate amount of exercise. But there was an awful lot of challenging going on by police, asking people what they were actually doing out in public. Is it necessary for you to be here? So there's an awful lot of supervision. As, as we start to decline much further down the line and get into uh, much higher rates of infections. And of course, there were numerous arrests for breaking lockdown laws, the impositions, penalties and fines to try and regulate that behavior as well. Now, we can think of this also in terms of sovereignty, but honestly, I don't think the situation worsened to the kind of extremes that we may uh, may align with the sovereign regime, perhaps only in a very uh, moderate sense. Um, but really, if we're talking about sovereignty, we're talking about kings and queens and kind of feudal societies. We're really talking about the absolute rule of a monarch, monarchy, kings or queens. And really the kind of punishments that you're likely to see meted out in those sorts of society are very punitive and very final. Um, I think, however, in the context that we've seen over the past 12 months, if we're to venture down an avenue and say, actually, the worse the pandemic got in the UK, the more akin this has been to sovereignty. Actually, this is rather more about the public's capacity to um, to enjoy freedom of movement. So we can think of this in terms of on the one hand, the use of force, but primarily um, the uh, not the use of force, land and wealth, but primarily the use of uh, force and the occupation of land and people's access to land and freedom of land. Now, quite interestingly, um, there are two or three things that we can talk about here. And the first, um, in the first instance, the management of public spaces. So um, the image on the right, again, is quite uh, accurate. This would be one of the larger parks, presumably in London. Um, where police had a fairly phenomenal presence, because really we're talking about a period from, uh, let's say, uh, the towards the end of March through to the Easter bank holiday, um, and thereafter through to uh, pretty much through to the end of the summer last year. Um, we're really talking about a period in which the police had a monumental presence in public places um, as a public service, and quite rightly so, um, but one in which public conduct was often challenged. What are you doing? Are you out here exercising? Sunbathing doesn't constitute exercise. So are you out here to socialize? Are you out here to exercise? What are you doing? So if we're thinking about the deployment of these normalizing and disciplinary practices, we can think of these in terms of the way in which the land was managed and people were managed uh, on the land. So we can also think of this in terms of threats and obligations. Um, Threats if you're uh, caught doing something you shouldn't be, you're going to get fined or you might get arrested um, um, at the worst case scenario. But um, uh, interestingly, the um, uh, Majesty's Constabulary managed different aspects of the pandemic in a number of different ways. The image that you can't see just behind this one is, um, is a natural beauty spot in Derbyshire. And um, it's, um, it's a man-made lake. It's a quarry um, known for its beautiful blue waters. And one of the things that Derbyshire Constabulary did during the early stages of the pandemic, amongst many others, for which it has been criticised, 
um, included dyeing the lake black. You can see the black dye going into the lake here to, um, to deter people from going and visiting it. Much later on in the pandemic, local farmers covered the area with uh, slurry, animal waste, again to put people off visiting that particular beauty spot. During the preliminary um, stage of the, uh, the um, pandemic, or rather as the pandemic worsened and picked up ground um, and a pace in the UK, um, Derbyshire Constabulary also sent uh, drones up into the Peak District to um, challenge people's behaviour and, um, and name, not name and shame, but certainly shame and raise awareness of people who were breaking the rules and going and walking um, um, their dogs um, up in the peaks. So it's quite interesting that the management of the land has also taken quite a prominent role in the UK's response to this crisis. Um, further into the pandemic, um, Northamptonshire police were also criticised um, uh, because uh, Nick Alderley, the police chief constable of Northamptonshire, was quoted as saying after only a few days, um, or rather at one point his force was only a few days away from marshalling supermarkets and checking items in baskets and trolleys to find out whether a, an item is legitimate. The reason for this was because in the UK we were only allowed to go out and purchase certain items and certain goods, say food, sustenance, beverages, um, essential goods, toilet paper, toiletries and so forth. And what happened really was because many people were furloughed or off work or simply lost their jobs, um, people were spending a lot more time in the home and because of that they were wanting to make home improvements. So they were buying paint, they were buying lamps, they were buying plants. And of course as far as the establishment's concerned or certain parts of the uh, British police force um, uh, these are not considered essential goods and items. So there is a certain degree of management in that particular manner. So overall, really what I wanted to do was reflect on these different techniques of government as effectively in the UK as the pandemic worsened. We've moved from, uh, let's say, we've moved from governmental responses, which we can think of in terms of uh, much lighter, light-hearted responses, such as using jokes and advertising campaigns, through to things which are a little bit more sinister and designed to uh, embed certain normalising practices and normative behaviour in society to change our conduct and actually start working towards a new normal. Um, and thereafter, to the kind of punitive uh, responses which are more akin to disciplinary society and certainly to the sovereign regime in the way that it would have managed um, uh, society during a pandemic of this nature. So hypothetically speaking, where, where have I been going with this? Well, in general, the idea was um, to actually look at quite how far we ventured towards one extreme or another during the past 12 months. And realistically, we haven't actually got to the uh, point, thankfully in the UK, where we've seen mass civil unrest, where we've seen riots. There could have been the potential for that to happen. Um, there have been those kind of altercations in other nation states throughout the world. Um, but it was really a question of how normatizing, uh, normalizing discourses and normative practices interplayed with the pandemic and the way in which society was managed. So um, thanks for listening. It is a, a work in progress, as I say, um, but um, feel free to ask any questions should you, um, should you wish to. Thank you.